Ah, okay. A7 R5. This is going to be a really hot topic and it's probably going to send the internet crazy because there are some, you know, controversial specs in this thing, but Sony are marketing this towards photographers. The R series is the resolution series. It's pretty much high resolution, great photography camera, can shoot videos really well, 8K, 25 frames per second, 4K, 60. There are some incredible specs, but the AI deep learning, the autofocus in this is just it's on another level when it comes to photography. I just, it's amazing. You can choose humans, you can choose birds, you can choose planes, cars. This thing is great and I cannot wait to unpack this with you guys. There are a few controversial ones which people are going to really pick on as per usual, but uh, this is a pre-release copy so the firmware could potentially change, but we got a lot to unpack. So let's get into this video. Okay, so we've got a lot to get through with the A7R5, but we may as well just change, turn the lights on, and you know, get this video started because the A7R5 is an incredible camera. Sure, it's about, I think it's 4,000 US maybe. It is 61.99 Australian dollars, so I don't know what that is in US because it really depends on the tax and all those kind of things, but 8K 25 frames per second, 4K, obviously there are a few caveats with this thing. 8K is 1.2 times crop, 4K 50 is 1.2 times crop. It's not down sampled when it comes to 4K. Well, it doesn't seem like it because we're comparing with the A7 IV and the A7 IV does seem better in 4K and 4K 50. But if you throw this into APS-C crop, you do get a 6.2K downsampled in 4K, which makes it a really good APS-C camera. And uh, some interesting things about this thing. Now, just like to jump in here and just remind you guys to give me a thumbs up, that'd be amazing. And uh, just remember that this is actually made before it's released and everyone else has formed their opinions on this. So this is my own opinion before anyone else gets to see any reviews or anything. So if I have missed something, hey, I'm human. I'll miss something. I'm sure I've missed something. I did it last time. But <laughs> this is my opinion. And uh, obviously we are all entitled to our own opinion, but I really do hope you are enjoying this video. So yeah, let's just continue with this video and have some fun. Now, before we get further deeper into the video specs, I do want to touch base on the menu systems and exactly what it has with photography because it is a photography based camera. So we'll talk about videos at the end, but the rolling shutter, we'll talk about low light performance in terms of the ISO range and all those kind of things when it comes to the quality of the video, but we'll talk about the photo stuff first. So I think one of the biggest things that I absolutely love about the A7R5 is the flip screen. So it doesn't just flip out, it also flips up. So it's a four axis screen. So you know like the A7 III where it you know, flips up or the A1 where it flips up, this one also has that flip up so you can keep you know, your framing in the center, but you can also flip it out as well if you want that nice flip out rotational multi-axis screen. It's incredible. I love the flip screen, but I know a lot of photographers really hate it. But you do have that option now where you have this flip up screen and it feels very durable. It like, if you've ever used the Canon C70, the, ca the flip screen is terrible. It is terrible and people have actually uh, returned it. But uh, even some of the A7 screens, they're not incredibly amazing, but this one feels extremely durable. And hopefully they'll do this with every single camera from now on. Now the subject tracking is probably one of the most impressive pieces. You can see I'm actually on the car and train mode and you can see it actually does really well, even if I have Amber and Azalea in the way, it'll still track my car quite well. Obviously, if you block the frame, it's going to focus on the closest subject, but still, look how well this is actually tracking onto the car. So there are a few bits and pieces where it gets a little bit lost, but I think overall, it is just, it's super impressive, especially if you do want to actually focus on a very particular subject like the car or an animal or a bird, and you're having some subjects in the foreground, it's still going to try and snap onto that particular subject that you've actually selected, which I think is incredible when it comes to this camera. Now, I think one of the biggest things when it comes to photography and people are going to actually complain about is the frames per second in burst mode. Now, it only does 10 frames per second in RAW and uh, obviously that's not fast, but you have to remember this is 61 megapixel sensor and it's not a stack sensor like the A1. Obviously, the A1 is a stack sensor, it's 50 megapixels, but you can actually get more frames per second because it's a faster readout sensor. 
Now you have to remember also that these are going to be usable frames. So if you have a subject that's moving, tracking it, you're going to get more uh, accuracy when it comes to hitting the focus, whereas some other cameras will have higher frame rates, but the autofocus is sometimes just that little bit off and some shots aren't actually usable, especially when it comes to sports and wildlife. This is a very, very important thing. And when it comes to autofocus and speed, they've actually optimized the G Master 100 to 400 millimeter lens. And to pair with that as well, that eight stops of IBIS, they're making this perform better with the A7R5 as well. So the 100 to 400 and I think the 24 to 105, they're optimizing the firmware in that. So the IBIS is going to be a lot better. And especially the 100 to 400 G Master is gonna be a really good sports and wildlife photography lens. And that's just gonna be so much better. You're gonna have more usable shots because it's more stable. You won't have to crank the ISO up. You can keep the shutter speed down, get some motion blur and stuff. But that is really important to think about. So a couple of things to mention, it does have a new heat sink, which seems to be pretty decent, but you do have a cap in that 8K at 30 minutes, but we'll talk about that later on. And as per usual, you do have to go into your auto power off temp settings and turn that to high because it's usually set to standard by default. Now it also does have your shutter when power off. So essentially your shutter comes down and uh, you're able to change lenses without any dust getting onto the sensor, which is a really cool feature and I actually use all the time now. Now it has inherited the new menu system of the FX3 and FX30 when it comes to the two drop down main menus. Obviously there isn't any Cine EI profile, but you can see there's a whole bunch of different settings that you can go through, which can make it easier to adjust rather than diving through the settings for your main features. Okay, so this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about the 8K, the 1.2 times crop. Let's talk about the 4K and 4K50. 4K50 is a 1.2 times crop. What's the image quality like? What's the rolling shutter like? Dynamic range, ISO performance. This is uh, this is the fun part. Okay, so I'm comparing the a7 IV against the a7R5 against the FX6. And this is 4K, 25 frames per second and ISO 800. Now, there doesn't seem to be too much of a major difference, but the a7 IV actually does look the best here when it comes to just the amount of resolution and sharpness. The FX6 and the a7R5 are very similar when it comes to that look. So I thought, oh, maybe I've done something wrong. The a7R5 should be a bit sharper, but it's probably pixel binned or line skipped. Now I went to Joanna's house and I wanted to test it with her. And sure enough, the same thing, the a7 IV did look better in 4K 25 frames per second, all low codec, than the a7R5. Now Sony actually claim in super 35 format mode, the a7R5 is 6.2K oversampled. So I wanted to test it up against the FX30, which luckily I just received today. And sure enough, it looks very similar when it comes to the FX30 and the a7 IV is slightly behind when it comes to that. Now I'd just like to add something here and you guys shouldn't really be pixel peeping like this. This is just to give you a general idea of what the sensors are like, what kind of image you could potentially get out of it because it's always different in the field and it's always different of how you expose it and pretty much it's all about storytelling anyway. This is just a little bit of fun, a little bit of informational stuff. So let's get back into this video. Now here's the a7 IV in 4K, the a7 R5 in 8K and the FX6 in 4K. Okay, so the image looks great in 8K, sure, but the rolling shutter is very far from subpar. It's, it's pretty bad. Look at the difference with the rolling shutter in 4K versus 8K. And it is extremely noticeable, and this actually does show in the field as well. So if you are doing any sort of fast paced movements or even regular pace movements, it's not that great. It's, it's very hard to use this. It would probably be used in very slow movements, uh, talking headpieces, and that is probably it. And you are capped to 30 minutes, and it is also a 1.2 times crop, and it's also 10-bit 420 as well. So there are a few caveats with this 8K. But when it comes to that 4K and you compare the rolling shutter, the a7R5 does actually look better than the a7 IV. It's because the a7 IV is actually downsampled from that 7K to 4K, whereas the a7 V, it's either pixel binned, I don't think it is downsampled, or if it is downsampled, it's probably partial of the sensor. Not 100% sure, but I would say it's pixel binned or line skipped. 
and also when you do put it into 4K50, which is 1.5 times crop on the A7 IV and 1.2 times crop on the A7R5, the A7R5 does actually perform better when it comes to rolling shutter. So I think the major takeaway here is that if you are shooting 4K, the A7R5 is going to be perfectly fine when it comes to rolling shutter. It's a pretty decent performance. Obviously, it's not like the FXX, FX3, or A7S3 when it comes to, you know, 8.7 milliseconds for that rolling shutter. You know, this is still pretty decent, and it does seem slightly less than the FX30. The FX30 does seem to perform slightly better when it comes to rolling shutter against the A7R5, but overall, this is a photography-based camera anyway, so we really should be too and too much of this video stuff but hey i'm a videographer this is what i do and this is what you're gonna get so yes the rolling shutter is slightly better in the a7r5 when it comes to the 50 frames per second and here's the 50 frames per second it's the a7 IV it's the a7r5 and it's also the fx6 and the a7 IV does look better in 50 frames per second sure it's a 1.5 times crop whereas the a7r4 is a 1.2 times crop and the fx6 is full frame and here's what it looks like in 1080p at 25 frames per second. The a7R5 does actually look a little bit better than the a7 IV, but it is much of a mushness here, whereas the FX6 is also very similar to the a7R5, which I usually think is the best. Now here's the difference in 1080p at 100 frames per second in SNQ mode. Now I'm only comparing the a7 IV versus the a7R5 because the FX6 well does 4K at 100 frames per second. And it does actually look like the A7R5 is slightly better in 100 frames per second. Now, this is a small preview of the high ISO slash low light performance as well, which I will cover in another video because it will take a lot of time. And I don't want to bore you guys with all this kind of technical stuff because some of this doesn't even matter. So overall, my thoughts, it's a fantastic camera. The A7R5 has done well. It is obviously not a revolutionary camera. It's more of an evolutionary camera in the R range. 61 megapixels, great resolution, pretty decent performance when it comes to video. You know, it has its caveats, but overall it's still pretty good. And it's, you know, it does photos well and it does videos quite well as, as well. So <laughs> I think you're buying a great camera, you know, $61, $6,200 Australian is pretty expensive. You could probably buy a couple of A7IVs for that price, but it's up to you. If you have the money, go for it. If you don't have the money, A7IV, FX30, A7S3, FX3, it depends on what you are actually targeting in your videographer, your photographer, your hybrid shooter, all those kind of things, you need to understand that. And hopefully I might bring a video out just to sort of, you know, uh, give to you guys some value in finding out what camera is best for you because there's so many cameras out there now. But yeah, on that guys, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up, that'd be amazing. And I'll see you guys in the next one. All right, let's get it.